The rise and fall of two-stroke outboards reads like a vintage Hollywood tragedy, a story of glory, betrayal, and a death that didn't have to happen. For decades, these thundering machines owned every lake, river, and coastline in America, their blue smoke rising like incense at the altar of summer itself. The very simplicity that made them invincible would ultimately seal their fate. However, somewhere out there right now, in the most unforgiving waters on Earth, operators who stake their lives on reliability are still choosing two strokes over everything else. So why did the industry abandon them, and what do these diehards know that the rest of us don't? Close your eyes and picture this. It's 1972. Lake of the Ozarks on a Saturday morning, the sun's just cresting the tree line, and across the water comes that unmistakable sound, a high-pitched howl that starts as a burble and crescendos into a banshee wail. That's the sound of a Johnson 135 V4 coming on plain, trailing a plume of blue-white smoke that hangs in the air like a promise. To anyone who grew up in the golden age of boating, that sound isn't just normal noise. It's the soundtrack to summer itself. The 1960s and 70s weren't just good times for two-stroke outboards. They were the glory days. These engines didn't just power boats. They defined an entire generation's relationship with the water. Mercury, Johnson, Evinrud, and later Yamaha weren't just building motors. They were building dreams. Every garage along every shoreline in America had at least one guy who could tear down and rebuild a two-stroke in his sleep, and every marina smelled like that intoxicating blend of gasoline, two-stroke oil, and possibility. These weren't the quiet, refined engines we have today. They were loud, they were smoky, and they were absolutely glorious. A Mercury 1500 inline 6 would shake your fillings loose at idle and pin you to your seat when you hammered the throttle. The Evinrude 235 V6 of 1976 pumped out power that made grown men grin like teenagers. These engines had personality character, and a simplicity that meant you could fix them with basic tools and determination. To understand why two-strokes dominated for so long, we need to go back to the beginning. The two-stroke engine concept dates back to the 1880s, when Dougald Clerk created the first successful design. But it wasn't until the 1950s that outboard manufacturers really cracked the code on making them reliable and powerful enough for serious marine use. The genius of the two-stroke design lies in its beautiful simplicity. While the four-stroke engine needs four piston strokes to complete one power cycle, intake, compression, power, and exhaust, a two-stroke does it all in just uh, two strokes. Every time that piston comes down, you get power. This means a two-stroke fires once per revolution, while a four-stroke only fires once every two revolutions. Right there, you've got roughly twice the power impulses in the same engine displacement. But here's where it gets interesting. Because two strokes don't need camshafts, valves, valve springs, timing chains, or any of that complicated valve train hardware, they're dramatically lighter. A 150 horsepower two stroke V6 from the 1990s might weigh 400 pounds, while a comparable four stroke could easily tip the scales at 550 pounds or more. When you're hanging that weight off your transom, every pound matters. The simplicity also meant fewer things to break no timing chains to stretch, no valves to adjust, no camshafts to wear, just pistons, rings, and bearings. Sure, you had to mix oil with your gas in the early days, but by the 1970s, companies like Johnson and Evinrude had developed oil injection systems that handled this automatically. By the mid-1980s, two-stroke technology had reached its zenith. Companies were locked in an arms race, each trying to outdo the others in horsepower, reliability, and performance. Mercury's 3-liter V6 engines were producing over 200 horsepower. Yamaha's HPDI technology was delivering incredible fuel economy for a two-stroke. Evinrude's fit ram injection was pushing boundaries. The performance advantages were undeniable. Professional bass fishermen wouldn't even consider a four-stroke. Offshore racers? 
all two strokes. Charter captains running twin or triple engine setups loved the weight savings and the instantaneous throttle response. When you buried the throttle on a properly tuned two stroke, there was zero lag, just immediate, violent acceleration that could pin you to your seat. And let's talk about that throttle response for a minute, because it's something that gets lost in modern discussions. A two-stroke responds to throttle input instantly because it doesn't have the rotating mass of a camshaft and valve train to accelerate. You twist the grip, and bang, the power is there. For tournament fishermen making precise casts to structure, or for offshore guys navigating inlet waves, that instantaneous response could make the difference between a good day and a great one, or between safe and sorry. The repair bills were lower too. A powerhead rebuild on a two-stroke might run you 1500 bucks if you did it yourself, or three grand if you paid a mechanic. Compare that to a modern four-stroke where just the parts for a timing chain replacement can run $2,000, and you start to see why commercial operators loved these engines. But even as two-strokes were reaching their technical peak, storm clouds were gathering. Environmental regulations were getting tighter, and two-strokes had an Achilles heel. Emissions. The very design feature that made them powerful also made them polluters. In a traditional two-stroke outboard, some of the fuel-oil mixture would escape unburned during the scavenging process, when exhaust gases were being pushed out and fresh mixture was being drawn in. Studies in the 1990s show that older two-strokes could discharge up to 30% of their fuel unburned into the water. That blue smoke we all loved, that was unburned hydrocarbons. On a molecular level, it was environmental disaster, even if it smelled like nostalgia and freedom. The Environmental Protection Agency wasn't just concerned. They were armed with data. Lakes with heavy boat traffic were showing elevated hydrocarbon levels. The Chesapeake Bay, Lake Tahoe, and other heavily used waterways were seeing measurable pollution from two-stroke outboards. And in the late 1990s, California started making noise about outright bans. Then came the regulation that changed everything. In 1996, the EPA announced new emission standards that would be phased in from 1998 to 2006. These weren't gentle suggestions. These were requirements that would reduce outboard emissions by 75%. For traditional carbureted two-strokes, meeting these standards would be nearly impossible without completely redesigning the engines. The industry scrambled. Mercury invested heavily in their Optimax direct injection system. Yamaha pushed forward with HPDI. Evin Rood bet big on their E-Tech technology, which used direct injection and computer control to dramatically reduce emissions. These were billion-dollar investments in trying to save the two-stroke. And here's what most people don't know. These new generation two-strokes actually worked. The Evinrude Rudy tech engines that debuted in 2003 were cleaner than most four-strokes, more fuel-efficient than their predecessors, and still maintained that two-stroke power-to-weight advantage. Mercury's Optimax engines were legendary for their reliability. Yamaha's HPDI systems were technological marvels. But the damage was already done. By the time these clean two-strokes hit the market, the narrative had shifted. The boating public had been convinced that four-strokes were the future, that two-strokes were dirty relics of a bygone era. Dealers were pushing four-strokes because the margins were better, and critically, the Japanese manufacturers, Yamaha, Honda, Suzuki, had already invested billions in developing four-stroke outboards and weren't about to let those investments go to waste. Here's where things get really interesting, and frankly a little controversial. By 2010, it was becoming clear that two-strokes were in trouble despite the technological advances. But this wasn't because they couldn't compete, it was because perception had become reality. Marine dealers who had once sworn by two-strokes were now telling customers that everyone was going four-stroke. It became a self-fulfilling prophecy. Mercury made the strategic decision to focus primarily on four-strokes, though they kept their Optimax two-stroke line for customers who demanded it. Yamaha went all in on four-strokes, and then in 2020 came the knockout punch. Evinrude, a brand that had been building outboards since 1907, 
announced they were ceasing production entirely. The parent company BRP decided to exit the outboard market altogether. The death of Evin Rood wasn't just the loss of a brand, it was the effective end of mainstream two-stroke development in the outboard market. Mercury had already discontinued their Optimax line in 2018, and you can still buy small two-strokes from several manufacturers, but the high-horsepower, big-engine market, it's now almost entirely four-stroke territory. Now, before we talk about where two-strokes are still thriving, and you'll be surprised by some of these applications, let me remind you to hit that like button and share this video with your boat buddies. The places where two strokes refuse to die tell us everything we need to know about whether the technology is really obsolete, or if it was just killed by politics and perception. Stay with me here. Here's what the four-stroke zealots don't want you to know. In some of the most demanding marine applications on Earth, two strokes are still the preferred choice. And we're not talking about backyard tinkerers, we're talking about professionals whose lives depend on reliability. Commercial fishermen in Alaska and the Pacific Northwest, many are still running older Optimax two-strokes or have switched reluctantly to four-strokes. When you're fishing 200 miles offshore in 8-foot seas, weight matters. The Coast Guard requirements mean you're already carrying survival gear, electronics, and enough fuel for extended range. The last thing you need is an extra 150 pounds of engine weight. Those old Mercury Optimax and Yamaha HPDI engines can do the job lighter and with fewer maintenance headaches than a four-stroke. The military still uses two strokes in many applications. Navy SEALs and Special Operations Forces often use boats powered by two stroke engines because they need the power to weight ratio. When you're doing insertions in hostile territory, you want an idol that's light enough to manhandle but powerful enough to get you out of trouble fast. And here's the kicker in many developing countries, two stroke outboards are still the dominant technology. They're easier to repair with limited tools, parts are cheaper, and when you're running a fishing operation in Southeast Asia or South America, the simplicity of a two-stroke makes economic sense. Perhaps most interesting are the recreational boaters who flat out refuse to switch. These aren't ignorant holdouts. Many of them are engineers, mechanics, and lifetime boaters who've done the math and decided that for their use case, a two-stroke still makes more sense. Talk to a serious bass tournament fisherman and you'll find plenty who are still running two strokes. They'll tell you about the weight savings, the whole shot, the instant throttle response. They'll tell you about watching guys with modern four strokes struggle with hot start issues while their 20-year-old Mercury fires on the first crank every time. The restoration and vintage boat community has kept thousands of older two strokes running. There's a thriving market in parts, expertise, and knowledge. People who own classic wooden boats or vintage fiberglass often keep their original two-stroke power plants because they're period correct. And because mechanics who've worked on both will often admit, quietly, that they prefer working on two-strokes. Uh, fewer parts, simpler diagnosis, easier repairs. A powerhead replacement on a two-stroke is often a weekend project. The same job on a modern four-stroke can require specialized tools and computer diagnostics. Here's the part that might make some people uncomfortable. The death of two strokes wasn't purely about environmental necessity. Yes, older carburetted two strokes were polluters, but the modern direct injection two strokes that came along, they were cleaner than many four strokes, more fuel efficient, and still lighter. What really killed two strokes was a combination of factors. First, the enormous investment Japanese manufacturers had made in four-stroke technology needed to be recouped. Second, the public perception had shifted, and perception is reality in consumer markets. Third, and perhaps most cynically, four-strokes are more profitable for manufacturers and dealers. They're more complex, which means higher prices and more expensive maintenance. A modern 300 horsepower four-stroke might cost $35,000 or more. The maintenance schedule requires more frequent oil changes, more expensive parts, and more specialized service. That's great for the marine service industry, but it's tough on boat owners' wallets. And there's an argument to be made that we threw the baby out with the bathwater. The E-Tech engines in particular were technological marvels. 
They were direct injected, computer controlled, and incredibly efficient. They met or exceeded all EPA emission standards. They were lighter than equivalent four strokes, which means boats could carry more fuel, more gear, or more people. But they died along with the rest of the two stroke market. For small engines, the 15 horsepower and under market, two strokes will probably survive. They make sense for small tenders, dinghies, and sailboat auxiliaries where weight is critical. But for the high horsepower market, that train has left the station. Even Mercury, who kept their Optimax line alive longer than most, discontinued production in 2018. What's particularly frustrating for two-stroke advocates is that the technology had evolved to the point where it could compete on emissions while maintaining its traditional advantages. But market forces, manufacturers' strategies, and public perception created a perfect storm that the technology couldn't survive. Mercury had already discontinued their Optimax two-stroke line in 2018, leaving only smaller displacement models. The death of Evinrude in 2020 was symbolic. Here was a company that had invested hundreds of millions in clean two-stroke technology, had engines that were genuinely excellent, and still couldn't make it work in a market that had already decided four-strokes were the future. In the rush to embrace four strokes, we've lost something that's hard to quantify. We've lost that immediate throttle response, that distinctive sound, that simplicity that meant any shade tree mechanic could keep an engine running. We've gained quiet, refined power plants that are undeniably cleaner and smoother, but they're also heavier, more complex, and more expensive to maintain. The old-timers will tell you that boats aren't as fun as they used to be. Part of that is nostalgia, sure, but part of it is real. Modern outboards are so quiet and smooth that you can barely tell they're running. That might be great for a Sunday cruise, but it removes some of the visceral connection between operator and machine. We've also lost the weight advantage. For smaller boats especially, the extra weight of a four-stroke can significantly impact performance. A 17-foot bass boat that once ran on a 150-horsepower two-stroke might struggle with the weight of a comparable four-stroke. Yes, modern four-strokes have got lighter, but they're still heavier than their two-stroke equivalents. The rise and fall of two-stroke outboards teaches us something important about how technology changes and sometimes dies in the modern world. It's not always about pure technical merit. Politics, perception, corporate strategy, and market forces all play roles. The cleanest, most efficient two-strokes ever built died not because they couldn't compete but because the battle for public perception had already been lost. By the time Evinrude had perfected E-Tech technology, boat buyers had been convinced that two-strokes were environmental disasters and four-strokes were the responsible choice. Meanwhile, Mercury Optimax engines are still out there running 10,000 hours with minimal issues. Commercial fishermen who rely on their equipment for their livelihood are still choosing them, and in applications where weight and simplicity matter, two-strokes continue to prove their worth. Thanks for sticking with me through this deep dive into two-stroke history. If you want to keep the engines ticking over, check out my video where we rank 21 outboards from worst to best. You'll get another dose of engine history that'll have you missing the good old days. The story of two-stroke outboards is a tragedy of perception over reality. A technology that evolved to meet every challenge thrown at it, only to be killed by market forces and corporate strategy rather than any technical shortcoming. If you hear that distinctive howl across the water some early morning, savor it, because you're hearing the echo of an era that's slipping away. Until next time, keep the shiny side up and the prop in the water.